Thank you, David. It's nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations I call the world's most powerful private organization. It's probably the most powerful private organization in world history. And why have very few people heard about it? <laughs> well, they operate behind the scenes. That's the reason. It's a body by, of, by, and for the U.S. and world plutocracy. Uh, it's personified by the person of David Rockefeller, uh, the only living grandson of the robber baron J. D. Ro John D. Rockefeller. Uh, David Rockefeller became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in 1941. In 1949, he became a director. In 1970, he became the chairman. Uh, he stayed chairman until 1985, and now he's the honorary chairman. He's still alive. He was born in 1915, so he's, this year he's 101 years old. He's the largest single donor to the Council on Foreign Relations. In one year alone, he gave over $25 million to this organization. So let me read a little bit from the book. Of course, I'm going to be talking about uh, the book as we go along, but let me just read uh, a little bit from Wall Street's think tank. The think tank of monopoly finance capital, the Council on Foreign Relations, is the world's most powerful private organization. The CFR, as we usually call it, is the ultimate networking, socializing, strategic planning, and consensus forming institution of the U.S. capitalist class. My first chapter is the capitalist class of this book, is the capitalist class in the Council on Foreign Relations. So I have extensive documentation as to why this is a capitalist class organization, even though it has other types of members. It's a big organization. It's got 5,000 members. It also has uh, uh, people that are not members of the capitalist class, but they usually aspire to be members of the capitalist class. They're usually part of the, uh, what I call the professional class or the coordinator class that is well-educated people that can serve the capitalist class. Uh, it is the central high command organization of the U.S. plutocracy that runs the country and much of the world. The council is the most important U.S. and global center of deep politics and the deep state that rules behind the scenes, a way that the 1% conducts their unrelenting class war against the 99%, keeping us divided and in conflict with each other. That's how they rule, of course, one of the ways they rule. Despite pretensions to democracy and endless attempts at instructing the world, U.S. democracy, quote unquote, is in reality largely a fraud, a hollowed out shell devoid of any substantive con content. The fact that the U.S. government, led behind the scenes by the Council on Foreign Relations, is largely run in an anti-democratic fashion by and for the interests of a financialized capitalist class, their corporations and the wealthy families that control and benefit from these corporations. No matter who is elected, people from the council propose, debate, develop consensus, and implement the nation's key strategic policies. The deep state, in the form of the CFR, operates behind the scenes, making and enforcing important decisions outside of those publicly sanctioned by law and society. A focus on the Council on Foreign Relations is a key way to understand concretely the central sector of the ensemble of power relations in the United States and its informal global empire. A big and complex organization, the CFR is unique because it combines a well-staffed scholarly think tank with a large dues-paying membership. That's unique. Uh, if you talk about other think tanks, whether it's Brookings Institution or the, uh, any number of them you could name, the Center for Strategic and International Affairs, etc., uh, they they're not membership organizations. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations is a very large and active dues-paying membership. It has a long history since 1921, uh, really the First World War, you can trace it back to 1918 even, but it was formally founded in 1921. Uh, a long history, many faces, and multiple facets, including publishing Foreign Affairs magazine. A uh, magazine founded in 1922 that the Washington Post has called, quote, the Bible of foreign policy thinking, and it's used around the world. Foreign Affairs has a very big audience. It has published tens of thousands of publications of various types, from books to blogs, during recent decades. Just during recent decades, it has tens of thousands of publications. During every decade, it holds thousands of membership meetings starring top political and economic leaders from a wide variety of nations, as well as many leading intellectuals. The Council's work since the mid-1970s has largely focused on creating, planning, promoting and defending a U.S.-dominated, world-spanning, neoliberal, geopolitical, 
empire that due to the resulting mass poverty of billions of people has been called, quote, a criminal process of global colonization by the Brazilian theologian Fra Beto. Samira Min labels the system as one that imposes a, quote, lumpen development model of pauperization and super exploitation on the people of the South, the majority of humankind. This imperialist empire is mostly an informal one, but its rule over and exploitation of a considerable part of the world and its people is nevertheless very real. Uh, throughout the book, I uh, use various quotes at the beginning of each chapter, beginning of the book, and in the first chapter on the Council of the Capitalist Class and the Council on Foreign Relations, I use these two quotes that I like a lot. Throughout, there's quotes, so if you're interested in, in uh, what I consider to be useful quotes, this one's from Rosa Luxemburg. The first revolutionary act is to call things by their true names. That's why I call it the, the capitalist class in the Council on Foreign Relations. Because usually, if you even hear about the Council on Foreign Relations, it's mentioned as an expert organization, quote unquote, experts. They're experts. No, they're the big capitalists. And they have two types of memberships. They have individual memberships. As I mentioned, there's about 5,000 of those. They also have corporate memberships. Well, you can guess which corporations are the members of the Council on Foreign Relations. There's about 170 of them, and it's all the big New York banks. It's foreign banks and foreign corporations as well. The Council's organization for individuals is only U.S. Uh, individual, uh, US citizens can be in the Council individually. But for the corporate membership, you can have all these, you know, Deutsche Bank and, uh, you know, the uh, big oil companies uh, that are foreign oil companies. Uh, so, of course, it's all the big corporations, the multinational corporations that you could name. Uh, so that's the capitalist class worldwide that's membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. Also, sometimes conglomerates, too. That's a topic that I'm getting more interested in, the worldwide concentration of capital in conglomerates. And a lot of these con conglomerates, uh, whatever country their origin is, they're mem uh, corporate members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And the other quote I like is from Eugene V. Debs, uh, the early socialist leader, uh, from the early 20th century, the economic owning class is always the political ruling class. Another, another uh, little section I want to uh, read about is the members. And this, is, uh, this quote is from the Council on Foreign Relations 2014 Annual Report. Uh, my book is 352 pages long. It has 798 footnotes. <laughs> Doing all those footnotes was an effort, but I wanted to just some in some circles, maybe not in this room, probably, but some circles. What I'm saying is controversial, so footnoting it heavily, proving it with the council's own publications from their website. And if you're interested in more information on the council, even that I have in my book, they have a website, cfr.org.org, that you can get vast amounts of information from about the council, and you can get their recent, more recent annual reports. I've been collecting. I started studying the council in 1969, uh, so I've been studying it a long time, not, you know, full-time, all the time, but I've been collecting information since 1969 on the Council on Foreign Relations, so I have the annual reports back to almost that period, uh, 1972, I think is the earliest one I actually got the annual report, even though I started studying it a little bit earlier than that. Anyway, you can get the more recent annual reports on CFR.org, you can see their membership list, you can see their corporate membership list, you can see their board of directors, all that kind of stuff you can find on CFR.org, a very large uh, website. And you can print out their annual report too. This, uh, here's a, the most recent one is 2015, so that's how it looks. You can print it out uh, from CFR.org if you like. So this is a quote from the 2014 annual report, and I'm trying to make the point that the CFR is a very important organization. This is from their own annual report. CFR members are and always have been its most valuable asset, a pillar of the institution's strength an indication of its influence. The roster today, that is 2014, counts two former presidents, two former vice presidents. There have been a total of seven presidents and seven vice presidents in the council's history, 26 Pulitzer Prize winners, nine Nobel laureates, laureates, 96 Rhodes Scholars, and there's a big connection between the Rhodes Trust uh, historically in the Council on Foreign Relations. That's a whole interesting story in itself, but 96 Rhodes Scholars were members of the Council in 2014. <laughs> so that's quite a few. 52 leaders of Fortune 500 companies, 42 special envoys, 62 admirals and generals. 
So they have a big influence into the military as well, uh, in, in admirals and generals in the U.S. Armed Forces. Since the CFR's founding, 30 secretaries of state have served as members. The caliber of the CFR's members is one reason the organization is able to attract such prominent speakers in terms of their membership meetings. Then just to give you a flavor of their meetings, I have a whole chapter on the organizational history of the council where I go into uh, something about their whole program, but uh, it's obviously this is a big book. We're only going to cover the high, few highlights today. Uh, but just to give you an example, under their 1995-96 meetings, uh, the CFR meetings on October 23, 1995, illustrate the organization's impressive convening power. This is just one day at the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, they, they're active, you know, every, not every day, not the weekends, but they're active every day with various things going on at the Council headquarters. So this is a quote from one of the Council annual reports. Quote, the Harold Pratt House, the Harold Pratt House is their New York headquarters. The Harold Pratt House is it's Upper East Side of New York, the, the rich area, you know, where the, the wealthy live. It rang with many different voices all at once. On one single day, the council hosted Cuban President Fidel Castro Ruz, PLO leader Yasser Arafat, Uzbekistan President Islam Kamarov, and Czech Republic President Vaclav Havel. So there's an idea of the range. Vaclav Havel, of course, was a you know, right winger. Uh, Fidel Castro Ruz is one of the major left wingers of the world. So in the same day, they had both those people and these others as well. Uh, so it's pretty, you know, you start studying this organization, it gets pretty amazing sometimes. Um, one of my chapters, I go into uh, the council and the U.S. government. And I looked at uh, 96 top government policymakers during the 1976 to 2014 years, which is what the, the book is covering. So I looked at uh, the President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, all those for the Carter administration to the Obama administration. And 80.2% of those leaders were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. 80% of those. Uh, and 22%, almost 23%, 22.9% were CFR directors. If we add in representation of top, I also cover top advisory boards and organizations, various things like the Defense Department's Advisory Board, the State Department's Advisory Board, etc. Uh, we've come to another almost 100 people, and 70%, 70.8% 70 of those people, the advisory boards, were CFR members. These are extremely high numbers. No other organization comes close to those numbers. Finally, since uh, it's in the news right now, uh, on as far as the... Uh, uh, advisors and so on. We have Hillary Clinton. Now, it's, Hillary Clinton's an, an interesting case because her husband, Bill, became a member of the Council of Foreign Relations in the 1980s. Uh, uh, he was recommended by uh, Madeleine Albright, who was a longtime member of the Council. So he, he got in in the 1980s, and of course, uh, Hillary could have become a member very easily, but she never did, but her daughter Chelsea became a member in, in 2012. And Chelsea, of course, Chelsea's husband is a, is, a, is a hedge fund guy that worked for Goldman Sachs. You know, the, the Wall Street connection comes in there again. So she's not a member of the CFR, but uh, she was uh, spoke at the council at least 10 times in recent years. And one of those was an address opening the second CFR headquarters. The CFR is expanding. Of course, they're getting bigger in terms of their wealth and the, uh, their, their endowment and in terms of their uh, numbers of members. And so they got a second headquarters in uh, 2000 and, uh, I think it was 2009. They opened up a second headquarters in Washington, D.C. So Hillary was Secretary of State, so of course she'd been speaking at the council many times, so she came to open the second CFR headquarters. Uh, the, from the New York is the, is the original headquarters. So she made a statement on how central the council remains in policymaking at the highest level. Here's a quote from Hillary Clinton at the council opening for their headquarters in Washington, D.C., their second headquarters. Quote, it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Why is that? <laughs> Quote, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to be told what we should be doing. 
and how should we how we should think about the future end quote from Hillary Clinton that's on the CFR website <laughs> in case you wanted to check it you could just get on the website type in Hillary Clinton's speech 2009 before the CFR and you can you can use probably even a, a video there of YouTube <laughs> now the council is important to know in the first part of the book part one is on the council and its power and its connections and how it's a ruling class policy organization the second part of the book, part two, is on the Council on Foreign Relations worldview. And my earlier book, uh, Imperial Brain Trust, was held up as an example of my work because that came out in 1977. We finished work on that. In, uh, I was a, had a co-author, Bill Mentor. We finished work on that book, Imperial Brain Trust, on the Council in 1976. So this book is a follow-up to that. But in that book, Imperial Brain Trust, we didn't cover much on the Council's worldview or their world outlook. And so I thought it was important to not just have an update on the council since 1976, but also have more on their grand strategy, what their worldview is. And I sum it up with the term neoliberal geopolitics. So that covers the economic and the geopolitical or power politic aspect of the council's worldview. And if you look at American foreign policy, and this, this book has a chapter on the Iraq war, which is an example of that neoliberal geopolitics in action, and the Council on Foreign Relations was very much active in promoting that war before the war got going, of course, and council people in office, uh, you know, the 80%, you know, that I've mentioned that were council people in the, in the administrations, various administrations, 80% average. I think in the, uh, Bush, the, the uh, second Bush administration, it was even a little bit higher. Uh, they uh, promoted people like Paul Wolsewitz and Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Dick Cheney, these are all Council on Foreign Relations people. They're the ones who pushed this war, and it was a war to open up Iraq for neoliberal exploitation. And that's what Bremer was sent over. Bremer worked for Kissinger. He was a member, another member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Kissinger got his start in the Council on Foreign Relations. Condoleezza Rice got her start in the 1980s in the Council on Foreign Relations. That's where she met the Bush people and got going in that. Anyway, it was the idea was to open up, destroy the government there, and open up that to neoliberal exploitation. It didn't work out exactly like they thought because the Iraq people resisted. They didn't want to have neoliberal exploitation imposed upon them. But anyway, that's their worldview, uh, neoliberal geopolitics. And of course, the Iraq war had a geopolitical aspect in the sense of that was where a big pool of oil, easily exploitable oil was. So the US uh, oil corporations, who were members of the CFR, corporate members, like ExxonMobil and Chevron and others, wanted to get in there. So now I'm going to read about the summary for the worldview of the Council, neoliberal uh, geopolitics. As a capitalist class dominated organization, the Council has been since its founding during the First World War era, dedicated to the promotion of the expansion of U.S. economic power abroad. Since the mid-1970s, this has been done by attempting to create pro-capitalist utopias for U.S. corporate investment and trade, nations where capital is unrestrained and low-cost resources and labor could be acquired, allowing high profits that could be repatriated to the United States. The term neoliberal geopolitics is used to characterize the world-spanning system of the CFR and its allies, including the U.S. federal government, and that system created over the last few decades. Included in this term is the subject of geoeconomics, which is properly seen as a subset of neoliberal geopolitics. The Council's version uh, version of neoliberal geopolitics focuses first and foremost on the wealthiest and most powerful regions of the world, the so-called triad, triad, North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. Secondarily, regions adjacent to these areas, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Southwest Asia, are also seen as especially important. Other parts of the world, although less central, are nevertheless valued as places where specific resources can be acquired and markets penetrated. Iraq is an example of that. Chapter 5 outlines in detail the origins and nature of the neoliberal geopolitical worldview and how it grew out of the thoughts and actions of a number of CFR leaders and members. Chapter 6 illustrates how the war on and occupation of Iraq had its twin goals, a long-term shift in the world balance of power in favor of the United States and the creation of a neoliberal utopia for Western capitalism. Chapter 7 has a number of short case studies collectively showing the range the great range of the Council's grand strategic and tactical planning for the whole world. Chapter 8 reviews the numerous studies the CFR has conducted on the issue of climate change, 
They haven't ignored climate change. They just haven't wanted to really solve it because solving climate change re involves overthrowing the capitalist system. And they're all about preserving the capitalist system. So the only thing they can consider is market solutions, which are no solutions at all, to, uh, in my view, to the uh, issue of climate change. So anyway, they started studying this as early as 1990, and they had the ultimate conclusion, conclusion that you have to continue business as usual. The final chapter reflects on what the central role of the CFR means in terms of democracy and the public interest, asserting that its designs will inevitably fail due to multiple reasons, including declining American hegemony and the fact that CFR policies work worsen a rapidly developing planetary ecological crisis. Part two closes, of this book closes with a call to action. The peoples of the world must overthrow monopoly finance capital and its global system of neoliberal geopolitics in order to end the serious threat they pose to the ecological foundations of life on Earth. So I'm going to read a little bit more from that later, but right now I want to go into uh, the labor movement and the CFR. Now you wouldn't think the labor movement would be involved in the CFR, but in fact the FLCIO had direct representatives on the board of directors of the CFR from 1976 to 2001. 1976, Lane Kirkland, who was assistant, chief assistant to George Meany, became a director of the Council on Formulations. He lasted till 1986. Glenn E. Watts of the Com Communications Union was on the board of directors of the CFR from 1987 to 1990. And Thomas R. Donahue uh, was from 1990 to 2001. He was briefly the president of the FLCIO. He was also, he was an advisor to Kirkland. So that's a very interesting fact. And how do you explain it? And the way I explain it is in this, this period, 1976, to, since 2001, there hasn't been any Council on Foreign Relations person on the board of directors of the CFR. Why is that? I think it's because labor has become irrelevant. Whereas in 1976, the labor movement was still strong enough to cause some trouble to the capitalists. And they were beginning their neoliberal push to have a new system which was going to undercut labor because their accumulation system now the way they accumulate capital is more than anything exporting the jobs over to overseas so they can get cheap labor and cheap resources in other countries. China is one of the prime examples. Look at Apple. What's their business model? Build all their stuff in China for, for peanuts, bring it over here and sell it for up, up the price by three, four, five hundred percent. That's what they do. They have some design facilities here, but their production facilities are all overseas. So this was early when they had these. CFR member, uh, board of uh, people from labor on the CFR board, 1976-2001, they were still beginning to implement this. They didn't know how labor was, was going to react, but one thing that happened in that same period was the strength of the labor movement went down big time. Uh, you know, in 1950s, a third of the working class of the United States was in labor unions, and it gradually declined, and then the precipitous decline was exactly this period when the CFR brought in labor movement people into their board of directors to get their gauge their reaction. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more, of course. But uh, that's from the point of view of the capitalists. They don't need the CF, or they don't need the labor movement anymore, except they have members. Uh, the labor movement does have some members still, uh, but uh, they don't have anybody on the board of directors since 2001. Now, if we go back in history here, we see that uh, there were CFR uh, labor movement people in the CFR as early as the 1950s, maybe even earlier, because I didn't have the earlier annual reports. But David Dubinsky of the International, uh, the Ladies Garment Workers Union, he was a member of the CFR. And Jay, Loves, Jay Lovestone, who of course a CIA connected guy uh, that was once uh, a leftist, then became a uh, AFL CIO guy and, and went into the CFR. Walter Ruther of the UAW was in the CFR. Irving Brown, who was uh, also connected to the CIA. And the, he, was from, he worked in the AFL-CIO's American Institute for Free Labor Development. Those were early members in the 70s, 60s, and even the 50s, uh, CFR members that, from the labor movement. Then later, as I mentioned, uh, Kirkland became a member. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you had a number of others, uh, like George Meany's uh, son-in-law, Ernest Lee. And then you have somebody named Theo Lee that's uh, presently a member of the CFR, Barbara Shaler is a member of the CFR, and she even served in the State Department. 
uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, a number of others uh, have been in the CFR in recent times. And of course, this is, is in many respects an inglorious history uh, because the, the uh, labor movement has taken money from the U.S. government through the National Endowment, uh, was it National Endowment for Democracy, and used that money to give to reactionary uh, labor movements in other countries. Uh, and it was in, tied up with the attempt to overthrow the Chavez government in Venezuela, for example. Uh, and also, of course, earlier uh, in the Pinochet coup, the, uh, some of these AFL-CIO people that were in the CFR were involved in that, too. Uh, so it's a pretty inglorious history. But let's, uh, as I mentioned, they don't uh, have uh, the, any, uh, the AFL-CIO doesn't have any uh, leaders at the top of the CFR now, but Trumpka, Richard Trumpka, who's not a member of the CFR, uh, some of his advisors are, and Sweeney, uh, by the way, uh, John Sweeney, who became the head of the AFL-CIO in 1995, he joined the CFR in 1998 and has spoken a number of times, uh, several times, according to the CFR president. But Trumpka went to speak, even though Trumpka is not a member of the CFR, he was invited to go to speak once, and we have from this CFR, the CFR uh, website, CFR.org, we have some uh, statements by Trumpka that he made at the CFR, which I think are very illuminating about the outlook of the AFL-CIO leadership. Uh, in his introduction, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, a man named Richard Haas, uh, who was advisor to George H.W. Bush and was in the State Department when the Iraq War started in 2003, uh, said that Kirkland, Donahue, and Sweeney have all spoken at CFR meetings in the past, and Sweeney spoke several times. So then he introduced Trumpka, and this is what Trumpka said, at the beginning, the, the president, current president of the AFL-CIO, he, he became head of the AFL-CIO in, in 2009. Thank you, Richard. It's wonderful to be here at the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, Richard Trumka also mentioned that he's been to Davos. Uh, now, of course, Davos was the major networking venue, and I have a, in my chapter on the Council's International Connections, Chapter 4, I go into Davos, and the people that go to Davos, a lot of them are Council on Foreign Relations people that come from the U.S. And it's very expensive to go to Davos. You just don't go there and, you know, spend a few dollars. You go there and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for Richard Trump to go there, he had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of union dues to go to, to Davos. And he mentioned, I was there at Davos networking uh, with the transnational capitalist class. He didn't mention the transnational capitalist class. But that's what, <laughs> that's what goes on there. It's where the U.S. capitalist class networks big time with the transnational capitalist class. Uh, so, anyway, he was at uh, Davos, and Trumpka said, quote, we need good jobs, quote, to rebuild our core national identity as a middle-class society. Now, what's wrong with that? And he also added, we need, there is a problem of rapid growth in income inequality. So, my comment on that, uh, that Trumpka is using this term, middle class. He's the leader of the American working class which is almost 80% or something like that. It's hard to determine exactly what the American working class is, but wage workers who depend on wages to live, as distinct from a capitalist class who can remain motionless 24 hours a day because he's got so much assets, money pours in like an avalanche, doesn't have to work, doesn't have to go to work, he's got lots of assets that he can live off just with his easy investments. But wage workers amount to 75 or 80% of the uh, Americans, that's the working class, and so he's using the term middle class. Middle class is a useless term, it isn't descriptive. Uh, there's the working class, there's what I call the professional or coordinator class, maybe 20 to 25 percent of those is, is that, in fact, most of these so-called leaders of the FLCI were actually from the professional class. They've got, they may have some working class roots, but they've been highly educated. And then the capitalist class is probably one percent, but Depending on how you define it, it could be as much as 5%. I define it in this book as anyone who has $10 million worth of assets or is a director of a major corporation or a partner in a major law firm. That's how I define the capitalist class when I'm defining this book. And if you had $10 million assets, you put it in the bank at, you know, or get some uh, bonds or something, 5%, that's $500,000 a year. You don't have to work at all. Uh, so anyway... Uh, Working class leaders should not use the term middle class. They should be using working class, talking about capitalist class and the professional class. 
Uh, so that's a misleading, you know, what are the other terms they use? Upper class, middle class, and lower class, right? Well, you wouldn't want to be a lower class person. Well, that's the working class. You should be using that. Uh, Trump, uh, again, another quote from Trump, identifies the problem of export of jobs. Quote in this speech before the Council on Foreign Relations, this is what Trump said. For a generation, we have made the mistake of orienting our international economic policies around the profitability of U.S. corporations abroad, pushing jobs to other shores, end quote. What's wrong with that? Well, <laughs> he's, first of all, Trump is identifying himself. We, with the state power structure by saying we. It's they, the ruling class, the capitalist class. They're doing it. We're not doing it. And then he says it's a systemic problem to export jobs. It was a mistake, he says. He uses the word mistake. It's not a mistake, it's a conscious policy to undermine the American working class and make vast profits off of super exploited labor in other countries. It's not a mistake, it's a policy. So he shouldn't be using the word mistake. Okay, another quote from Trump. In most countries, the business community is allied. Oh, did I say Trump? Sorry. <laughs> Trump cut. <laughs> Trump cut. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> did I say Trump? I just somehow by mistake. He's not like Trump. I, I, I wouldn't put that on him at all. No. So I made a mistake. Sorry. Uh, in most countries, the business community is allied with labor in calling to, on government to make investments. The AFL CIO has worked with the Chamber of Commerce to to re, uh, re, re, um, revive such an alliance here in the United States. Quote, and, and continuing with the quote, our allies in business, we and our allies in business stand shoulder to shoulder. Now is this what American working class leaders should be saying? Uh, well, another thing he said, I, I just saw, wrote this in later that I found in the same, uh, in the same uh, speech. We have, I, I have absolute belief in the corporations of this country, end quote. Richard Trumpka. So his reference point is the capitalist class people, not the American working class. He wants to lie with the bosses. We're going to lie with the Chamber of Commerce and the other bosses, not with the workers to fight the bosses, which is what we have to do. Then finally, uh, the last one I have is from this speech that he made before the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, quote, the FLCIO is ready to work with the president and his team to make the Trans-Pacific Partnership a new model for America's trade policy. Well, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a pro-corporate trade agreement that would seriously undermine our democracy and our sovereignty, and the AFL-CIO should be leading the resistance to this, not saying we're going to work with Obama to make it the best trade thing. So this is how craft unionism and business unionism functions as junior partners to the capitalist class, at the expense of workers at home and abroad, and sells us out. Now, what's been the result of this, this, these kinds of sellouts? Well, we have a crisis, worldwide crisis. Uh, we have no working class unity. We don't have vision. We don't have ethics. We don't have al altruism, which we should have in the leadership of the working class. And it's resulted also in the destruction of left, the left worldwide. The Council on Foreign Relations and the U.S. military and corporations have made it a conscious policy to destroy the left. So now we don't have any response to these uh, terrible things that are going on in the world, like deindustrialization, unemployment, and poverty through globalization, uh, where they leave the U.S. for cheaper labor abroad. Incarceration. We now have uh, prisons that have higher workers, and it's... It's really a crime, too, that Lane Kirkland was on the federal uh, prison board, which was setting up these prison semi-slavery uh, situations in U.S. prisons. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world, and African Americans and Latinos are especially locked up in jail, and they're working for 22 cents uh, an hour, uh, just slave labor. The migration situation is out of control. Middle East, Africa, Southwest Asia especially, but also from Latin America, is due to the wars, racism, and other aspects of the system. And 6,000 people have just died in recent months you know, trying to get to Europe uh, to get away from all the wars that the, the United States has fostered with its neoliberal geopolitics. Lack of democracy is another uh, 
We, we have the debasement of public life, the racism and scapegoating reaching a new high with Trump. And the problem is every, every election round, it seems to get worse. Uh, you might be able to overcome the Republican right wing and elect a uh, you know, neoliberal type and then it just gets worse because there's no solutions to, for the rank and file of the people. So they're subject to being demagogued by somebody like Trump. Uh, so they're licensing people's darkest instincts. The truth is not recognized. There's no trust, no dignity uh, in that uh, newest Republican Party nominee. Uh, and then the geopolitical situation, of course, we have uh, increasingly dangerous uh, conflicts in the South China Sea along the Rus uh, Russian border where NATO is arming and uh, building up along the, NATO, uh, uh, the uh, Russia's east, uh, western border. Uh, so we have that danger, the danger of right-wing nationalism growing worldwide, moving towards a, a Hobbesian kind of world of all against all. Uh, Trump does says that international law doesn't have to be respected. We've got neoliberal privatization. The wealthy went out in this market-based system. Inequality is growing uh, more and more. The wealth of the world's 62 richest people now is greater than the wealth of the poorest half of humanity. 62 people have more wealth than half of the people of the world. Almost one in three of the world's workers are now living in less than $2 a day. One in three. So this uh, privatization has, has resulted in that. Uh, we have the slavery and degradation of work worldwide. Uh, there, worldwide, there's a organization called a Walk Free, a Walk Free Foundation. Uh, their study found that there's 45.8 million slaves in the world today. 45.8 million. Endless wars, racist murders by police, capitalist, and finally, uh, well, not second to last, capitalist ecocide. I'm not ranking these in any particular importance, but this one have to be the, up at the top. Capitalist ecocide, the private corporations are subject to short-term market demands for endless growth, and this put us all on the road to planetary destruction and collective eco-suicide. Eco and I'll be saying more about that because my last chapter is on that topic, the need for eco-socialism, a new type of socialism that values nature. Uh, the old socialism didn't do that, in my opinion. And we need to be doing that. We have to have eco-socialism that puts nature uh, at a very high level. Uh, finally, a culture of alienation, addiction, violence, and cruelty in the streets, in sports, in entertainment, and in policy. So those are some of the results of this uh, neoliberal geopolitics. So let me turn now to uh, the future and uh, what we might be uh, doing, some policy suggestions. Uh, first, the political power of capital rests to some degree on the organizational an ideological disunity among the working class. The capitalist class works on promoting this disunity. An internationalist, uh, the, Rosa Luxemburg was an internationalist, she saw nationalism as a breach of international proletarian principle. Nationalism divides workers and sets them against each other, killing each other in wars while capital profits. So the answer is real democracy and trade unions and workers have to demand this. Freedom for workers. We need a positive and forward-looking vision of workers' power. Trade unionism should and must be a democratic and communities people's movement, not in any way a business run on corporate values and principles. Yet business unionism is the dominant current perspective of the American labor movement. And there's exceptions, great exceptions, like the LWU and others, uh, but we have to follow them by basing uh, that uh, not on the fact that workers should be junior partners of capital, but they should be in control. Workers should be in control and not just getting crumbs off the table from the more enlightened, quote-unquote, uh, sector of the capitalist class, which is getting less and less enlightened. <laughs> and they want to wipe out existing unions. So there is a, if there's going to be a future of the labor movement, we have to have end undemocratic top-down business unionism it has to be overthrown in, in favor of a democratic labor movement based on an educated, active, informed, and empowered rank and file with a serious vision of working class power and willing to fight for the class as a whole. And the current union leaders we have don't have that. Uh, I think we need a class conscious, ecologically aware, independent, eco-socialist, 
Green Labor Party of, by, and for the working class. A party based on altruism, solidarity with all the people of the world, and willing to put direct action on the agenda in order to create revolutionary change. So let me end by uh, quoting from uh, the last part of my book, the conclusion, which builds on this a little bit. And it's uh, the, the heading is, do humans have a future? Who's, whose future? The Council on Foreign Relations represents the theor theoretical expression, the personification of a form of social organization that cannot plan for the long term or in any way change the eco-destructiveness of its system, capitalism, that always brings forth behaviors in its own corrupt and ethically bankrupt image. We need a moral, political, and economic anecdote, the hegemony of an irresponsible capitalist class led by the Council on Foreign Relations. This alternative is expressed through valuing nature and humanity and their undeniable interconnectedness. A stress on the intrinsic value of nature differentiates eco-socialism from the other socialisms of the past. Eco-socialism challenges the fatal compromises that prior socialisms made with industrialism, resulting to impacts to nature and peoples, especially indigenous peoples. The new road for humanity must also have the overarching goal of an all-sided development for every member of the human family everywhere in the world, rather than, than the obscene commitment to unlimited wealth and unlimited power of the few over the many. Equality, scientific rationality, common prosperity, collective ownership, ecological values and practice, equitable distribution of income and wealth, and full participatory direct democracy, as well as humanity as protagonists and subjects of our collective destiny through organizations of freely associated labor are the interests of the vast majority, the working class. These interests must be asserted in revolutionary ways for humanity to survive. Eco-socialism represents these emancipatory objectives of a fundamentally different social order. We must strive for, for it by building the unified, combative, international mass movements and organizations of, by, and for the working class. To the CFR and others seeped in the status quo, this will sound too radical. Just as the U.S. abolitionists fighting slavery during the mid-19th century were seen as strange people who were willing to violate the laws of property and upend the economy of southern plantations in the cotton trade. We must recognize the emergency we are in and that the current status quo in regard to fossil fuel use is a death sentence for our children and grandchildren because our house, our elegant planet, is slowly burning down. The real danger we face is underreaction, not overreaction. The capitalists investing in and promoting fossil fuel use and seeing geopolitical advantage in more production must be bluntly asked, how will your stocks do when the ocean dies? When massive crop failures and heat waves kill millions of people, when monster storms and rising seas wipe out coastal areas, when planetary climate chaos makes billions of people desperate, taking care of our planet before it spirals into chaos makes good sense for everyone even the capitalists. The fragile, fragile fabric of planetary life will not be able to take many more years of the kind of wet, went and destruction of nature it has suffered at the hands of the CFR-inspired capitalist empire. If we as a species stay on our current path, relatively soon a time will come when the effects will be so severe that we, we will lose the ability to creatively plan for and implement our own future. We have only a severely degraded ecosystems remaining when planetary forces we cannot control are being unleashed. Uh, remember that uh, the uh, Venus, the temperature on Venus where the greenhouse gas uh, got out of control is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The slide into an unknown but surely unpleasant face, fate for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren will then become inevitable. But the promise of humanity resides within itself and this trend does not have to become our destiny. We must recognize that we have nothing to lose by revolting and engaging direct action except the dismal spectacle of observing a dying planet, constantly made uglier by continuing injustice and ecocide. We have a world to gain, the chance to save our beautiful Earth and its many life forms, including humanity itself. Humanity can have a future if we take that future into our own hands by asserting the people's right 
to alter our current destructive and undemocratic system, which is contrary to the needs and welfare of all of us. Thank you for your attention. So, now I'm open to questions and comments. I, I don't know what time it is or what timeline we have, thing. but I'm open to questions. Yes, please just ask questions, and uh, let's make them questions and not necessarily statements. <laughs> Oh, you want to call on people? That'd be great. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, has WikiLeaks or any, any uh, disclosures informed any of your research, or has that influenced any of your writing? In the past few not years? not WikiLeaks per se. Wikipedia, that encyclopedia, has uh, has been useful, uh, and the internet in general, of course, has, has got a tremendous amount of, as you know, a tremendous amount of data that you can collect on the personalities. Not so much on the Council on Foreign Relations itself, that's more their own website and their annual reports and so on, but you can get lots of information on details. For example, if you want to look up the wealth of Bill and Hillary Clinton, they said they were, uh, they did, they were uh, dead broke. They said they were dead broke yeah. when they left the White House. Now they're worth about $120 million. Not too bad. So how'd they get that? <laughs> what about that guy way back there? Now that I have a whole chapter on that, chapter six of the book. They were not ambivalent. They were promoting it from an early date, very, very strongly promoted. They even wrote a book. Their one of the staff members even wrote a book, "Threatening Storm: The Case for Invading Iraq." That came out. That book came out in 2002. The war started in, in early 2003. They were very much promoters. They weren't lobbyists. They were the ones in power and promoting as well from outside being in power. Good. Uh, Domhoff certainly very helpful. I didn't use Dyes that much. He was focused on New Haven, Connecticut, more more narrow. But Domhoff very useful. In fact, that's where I first heard about the Council of Foreign Relations, re reading Who Rules America, in the late '60s as a student, uh, at uh, you know graduate student. I read Domhoff's book, and he mentioned the Council on Foreign Relations that led me to start investigating that, and then then I started researching, wrote my dissertation on that. So Domhoff was very useful. Uh, the other question. Uh, about uh, Sweeney, uh, you know, it, it didn't change that much. Sweeney changed only a little bit. He still spoke to, the, he was still a CFR member, Sweeney, and spoke to the CFR a number of times, and I don't see that much change. Maybe somebody knows more than I do about, about that, but... Yeah, but, but the, the policies didn't change. It didn't give up business unionism or becoming junior partners to the capitalists. They didn't go into what's needed is, you know, revolutionary programs. And they, there weren't any sign of that, not even slightly, you know, Bernie Sanders type, you know, uh, social democratic type stuff. It was more, much more uh, middle, strip, middle of the road. Yeah. Uh, this guy right yeah. Here. Uh, I've always told my students that if they read Foreign Affairs, they'd have an idea of what the future was going to look like. <laughs> uh, what is the role and function of Foreign Affairs? Uh, it's a sounding board where they, uh, they have a range of articles. They'll even have sometimes left-wing articles, although it's a distinct minority. Uh, for example, during the Cold War period, the biggest single type of article in Foreign Affairs was on the Soviet Union and how to destroy the Soviet Union, etc. That was, if you look at through Foreign Affairs and you added up all the articles, the, so the Soviet issue was the big one that they always were covering. But it was, it was about tactics. Uh, you know, the different proposals, and then somebody who may be a member of the CFR or maybe not uh, goes into their views on things, and then they have a de debate within the council, and they decide. I didn't really talk about how they run their programs. They have study groups, lots of study groups in the council. For That's their think tank. And so they decide what an issue is. Or we have to deal with what's going on in uh, Syria or we have to deal with China or whatever. Then they get people together from a variety of viewpoints, within the establishment framework. They don't bring in Marxists or real left people into that. Uh, they might bring some, some labor people, but not 
leftists. You know, they don't want socialists. They don't want communists. Uh, that's they're about destroying that. So they bring those people in that have someone has business interest in China and other people have strategic views on it. They'll have maybe 20, 30, even 40 people that'll meet uh, every month or very often, discuss the issues that are coming up, and then what, maybe one of those will publish an article in Foreign Affairs, reflecting the group's view on things to try to disseminate that opinion, which is, and they don't identify, it doesn't say there, this came out of a council study group uh, led by Joe Blow. They just, Joe Blow wrote the article, he's a Harvard professor, you know, they have the, the professors that are in the, in the council are mainly Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago, and Stanford. And there's others, but those are the ones that have heavy representation of professors, experts that they use, experts on China or Syria or whatever they want to study, and they bring them into the study groups and then they come up with these policies and they debate it. And then some of those people then go into office. Wolfowitz, you know, is in a council study group, then he becomes the assistant secretary of defense, uh, etc. That's that's how it works, the in and out, in, or, in, in and out. Or. So if Clinton's elected, we can expect tons of council and foreign relations people to go into Clinton's administration, of course. Uh, you know, Trump, no, not so much. Trump is not connected. He's not connected to the council and foreign relations. He's saying all kinds of things against their views. You know, so that's kind of interesting. And this, in this respect, I think the period we're living in is some ways like a pre-revolutionary period. You know, I mean, we don't think of it that like that, but the fact that the Republican Party can be taken over by a neo-fascist, or a guy that's in some ways an out-and-out -out fascist, the fact that the Republican Party can be taken over by that, that says a lot about what's going on in our country in terms of the rank and file. Unfortunately, they're propagandized and they're turning to the right instead of turning to the left because the left is so weak. We've been such smashed for so many decades. But there, Trump doesn't have any answers. I call him Trump, you know, Mr. Civil War. He gets in power, we might have a civil war here because a lot of people aren't going to stand for the kind of crap he's going to lay down on us. We're going to have to become much more radical, and I hope it's going to be nonviolent civil disobedience, but who knows what's going to happen if Mr. Trump is, in fact, elected. But uh, So we're in a kind of a pre-revolutionary period, I think, and we can expect things like fascism to raise its ugly head, maybe more wars, maybe big wars might happen. You know, this conflict in the South China Sea is serious. Conflict with the Russia is serious along the borders because Russia's really pissed off that NATO has moved to their border because they were promised when they gave up Germany, they, they were promised by Secretary of State Baker that the NATO would not go to the border. Guess who, guess who promoted this? The Council on Foreign Relations promoted moving NATO to Russia's border. And Russia, of course, as we all know, suffered 20 million dead. 27. 27 million dead, okay, I stand corrected, in World War II. They're not interested in having opposition forces on their border. That really scares them, and it you know, logically should scare them. So anyway, there's dangerous things on nuclear war. I think the two existential threats to life on the planet, humanity, uh, to human life on the planet, are the climate crisis and the threat of nuclear war. Right, way back there. So I was curious, uh, based on just what you were saying about like, the Trump presidency, given what you know about these capitalists, uh, think and how much independence and power do you think a Trump presidency would really have? Uh, that, that's a good but tough question. Uh, given the fact that Trump wants to be a dictator, <laughs> I don't know, how else do you describe it? The guy that wants to be a dictator. I have all the answers. He never gives any concrete programs, but he has all the answers, and he's tricking a lot of people. He's an expert con man. Now, I think uh, Hillary Clinton's pretty good at conning people, too, so maybe you know, she'll be able to out-con him. I'm not sure. But <laughs> he's you know, top-flight con man, and he wants to be a dictator. So that's why you know, I was calling him Mr. Civil War a minute ago, uh, because he's, he's willing to go outside the law. Uh, he's willing to just ignore the Constitution, and, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of opposition to him uh, if, he, if he does get in power, and he's going to have trouble. Uh, I think the CIA, the CIA had said if Trump wants to torture, he's going to have to torture him himself. So there's going to be opposition <laughs> within the capitalist class. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets, a, I shouldn't say this, probably, yeah, but he gets, he gets uh, you know, who knows, uh, before he gets <laughs> elected, he might, the CIA may take care of him like they did. Apparently, CIA took care of Kennedy. Uh, you know, might, that might happen. But so it's very hard to say, but uh, those are a few, you know, ideas I have. I think he'd have a lot of trouble implementing 
any programs that he would have. Even the CIA said they won't torture for him, for example. How about the guy? Bill and Hillary are a team. They've always been a team, ever since they got going. And I don't know if people remember or not, but Bill Clinton ran on a program of stopping NAFTA. He ran on a program of stopping NAFTA. Stopping NAFTA. It was a Republican program. They, you know, they hadn't, it hadn't been passed. It had been negotiated with Canada and Mexico, but it hadn't been passed. Clinton said, he, oh, I'll stop it. What did he do when he got in? He, he got it passed, of course. He got all the Democrats to vote, or as many Democrats as he could to vote for it, and a lot of them sold out and vote for it. And so when Hillary makes some promises, I have to take a lot of it with a grain of salt myself because uh, there, there's a long history there of just, you know, saying one thing and doing How something David else. David there. Uh, yeah, um, there's a question in the audience about uh, what role Lori Garrett may have or... Yeah, Lori... CFR, yeah, she, she's a staff member at the CFR. They have a lot of staff members, and then they have all these professors that br they bring in, too. So some people have uh, looked at the CFR and said, well, they only have about 100 staff members, but Brookings has 300, so Brookings is more powerful. No, the CFR has 800 professors and 100 staff, so their real power is 900. But anyway, Lori Garrett is one of their paid staff, and she writes on health, world health things. Uh, and, and uh, she's maybe written a book that might be available here, I don't know. But they, produ they produce a lot of books as well as, you know, all these blogs and articles in Foreign Affairs and other magazines and op-ed pieces and testimony before Congress, and et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many places, these hundred uh, workers, that, you know, scholars at, at the Council on Foreign Relations and all these professors, too, that don't mention that they're members of the Council on Foreign Relations or doing things at the behest of the Council on Foreign Relations. Anyway, that's who Laurie Garrett is, yeah. Well, you should, if, if you're not in a union, you should try to organize a union. <laughs> if you are in a union, you should try to make sure it's democratic. If you're not in a, a political organization, you should join one, like the Green Party or the Peace and Freedom Party or some alternative of, to the Democrats and Republicans uh, and try to build that. Uh, you can... <laughs> Uh, make your voices heard by, I think people should vote for Jill Stein. The, the Green Party is becoming an openly eco-socialist party now. It hasn't been that in the past. I've been one of the people in the Green Party fighting to make it an eco-socialist party. We just have a, a new platform that's been passed which says the associated workers should be running the means of production. That's now the Green Party program. Yeah. Right out of Marx. Uh, so we, have, uh, we do have some op opportunities here to vote uh, other than the mainstream parties. So that's voting, and you can work for the uh, Green Party or some other you know, left-wing or non-capitalist party. I think ultimately we need a Green Labor Party. Uh, we, the Green Party is not going to be enough, uh, so we need to have more alliances. We need to, uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of, of joining the Peace and Freedom and the Green Party together, for example, and I work with Peace and Freedom Party people toward that end. Uh, so there's lots of things you can do, uh, but mostly revolves around direct action. That's the other thing. Uh, if there's a demonstration that you agree with against the TPP or something else, then you should be there in the streets. And if you're willing to do nonviolent direct action, that's even better. Uh, so there's a range of things that people can do. Uh, and you can even donate money to your, the party of your choice outside the Democrats and Republicans, which are the capitalist parties. And one way or another, they're conning people into uh, supporting capitalism. Uh, we have to overthrow capitalism if we're going to survive as a human species, in my view. It has to happen uh, fairly quickly in a few decades. It's not going to be, a, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, it's <laughs> not an easy task. It's a giant task. What about this guy right there? Yes, um, other than Hillary Clinton, who in, in her three years of being Secretary of State, approved over $3 billion in foreign arms sales, mm -hmm. other than her, Back to 1960, can you identify any Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense who has not been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Um, any Secretary of Defense? Okay. Or, well, uh, Rumsfeld was an ex-member of the Council on Foreign Relations. When he first got started, he was in the Council on Foreign Relations, but for some reason he dropped out. So by the time he, came, he became Secretary of Defense, he wasn't in the Council anymore. <laughs> but he could still count. Uh, I can't think of any. No, uh, Hillary Clinton's pretty much the exception. I think there were all all those people, you know, if you start naming them, Dean Rusk, yes, he was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And then, uh, of course,
Carter, people, uh, Cyrus Vance, he was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the National Security Advisors, too, were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. I don't think there are any. But this thing about Hillary Clinton is another, I won't, and then the arms sales is interesting because a lot of those same uh, countries that were given arms sales deals under Clinton gave big bucks to the Clinton Foundation. Yeah, they, like the Saudi government gave millions. I don't know exactly how much, but it was a range. They said over five million one year, over 10 million. And then Hillary Clinton approved arms sales to them after they gave big money to the Clinton Foundation. So the Clintons have a number of ways they're getting wealthy. You know, it isn't just the speeches before Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and Citibank and JP Morgan Chase. They're, you know, they get 250,000 or 300,000 for a couple hours. By the way, what am I getting paid for this? <laughs> uh, Maybe anyway, somebody will buy a book and you'll yeah, get that, some royalty. That's right, I get a royalty for a few bucks. Hey, that's okay. Anyway, you know, she gets these big, they, both of them get big bucks for speaking before the, and they won't tell you what they said. You know, they, they know one will release the speech. So that's one way they make a lot of money. Then they sold these uh, memoirs, they made a lot of money on that. And then the, the foundation. And the, the other thing about the foundation was that's the training ground for all their political operatives. And it's also if their political operatives are not running for office, then they bring in the political operatives for a cushy job, you know, at the foundation because they're getting the foundation's getting money from all these corporations and, you know, Coca-Cola gives five million, et cetera. Coca-Cola is very close to the council, a lot of it interlocked there, GE, so on and so on. So they got the foundation has billions. And so they can hire, hire these people, they were ex- workers for, you know, the chief of staff for Clinton or the fundraiser. In fact, Hillary, her chief fundraiser right now came right out of the foundation. He, he was a fundraiser in the foundation. Then as soon as Hillary ran for this, this round, he dropped out like last year or the year before, late last the year before, dropped out of the foundation, became Hillary's chief fundraiser. So, you know, they're, they're meshing these, all these different activities to make a lot of money and to do some corrupt Dealings too. This guy here. I think you're our last question, if you don't mind. Would you comment on the resistance to CFR values that we see in indigenous movements, like Idle No More, like the um, uh, the movements in Ecuador and in Africa? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, those those people in the indigenous movements, unfortunately, don't know about the CFR, but they are resisting corporations, and. I think that it's important for people like us to work with them because we can offer some skills sometimes that they don't have a chance to uh, gather. Like the Idle No More is active in the, the East Bay where I live and uh, they are dealing with Chevron and they, uh, a number of them aren't very savvy about <laughs> Chevron. They, they, they're, I, tend, I tend to think they're a little bit naive about Chevron's viciousness and willingness to exploit people they tend to think we can talk to Chevron and maybe Chevron will be all right. <laughs> so I uh, think that we need to be working with them because they have the right idea to try to stop these uh, exploitation of these foreign multinationals, and in, in the case of Chevron, uh, is right there in Richmond, polluting Richmond, and uh, you know, I don't know more is resisting that. So I think we need to be working closely with them. Uh, but they don't, they're not aware much of the Council on Foreign Relations, but they have the right idea of just trying to... the get, values. Oh, oh, yeah. No, their values are... You know, indigenous people in general have good values. Not perfect. I mean, no, no group is perfect. We shouldn't idealize any particular group. But indigenous, pe indigenous people have suffered under the repression of the multinational corporation. And they are people close to the earth, and so they're much more interested in saving the planet. Uh, and they're much more co communal and cooperative. In fact, the original, you know, communists were indigenous people. Winona, Primitive communism, so-called. Winona was their candidate. <laughs> yeah. I love Winona. Yeah. So that's right. <laughs> uh, Winona LaDuke was the Green Party candidate for vice president. Uh, so they're close to the earth. They're greens by their nature, and so their values are excellent, and we should be learning from them. That's right. There's a, when I say we need to be talking to them, it's a dialogue. We learn from them, and we talk to them. Yeah. We can have one more. Okay, one more. She has her hand up. How's what? Agenda 21. I don't know. You have to tell me what Agenda 21 is. What's that? Uh, I'm not familiar with that, so I can't make a comment on it. Agenda 21. 
I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know anything about it. Okay, thank you.